Welcome to BioCentury This Week. Today we have a special report from the BioEquity Europe Conference in Milan. While I'm camped out here at home in the San Francisco fog, I'm joined by three industry colleagues who are holed up hiding out in a conference room above a buzzing conference below them. So they're all sequestered and I'd like to introduce my, my guests. First up, we have Kateri Amadi. Kateri, can you introduce yourself? Sure, yes, I'm happy to. So, um, so I'm Kateri Amadi. I'm head of search and evaluation business development team at MSD for Europe and, and Middle East. I've been with the company about six years. Prior to that, actually, I was very much at the startup end of the business. And my previous role was CEO and founder of a company called Reviral, uh, which was recently bought by Pfizer. Excellent. And joining us from Medici, we have Francesco Di Robertis. Francesco. Uh, hello. Thank you for having me here. Francesco Di Robertis. I'm a partner at Medici. We are a venture capital firm uh, with a focus on Europe and the US in early stage rounds, classical venture capital. I've been with the firm for 26 years, so pretty much the, the whole history of the firm, and I'm happy to be in Milan for your event. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have Simone Fishburn, my podcast partner in crime. Simone. Simone Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief at BioCentury. Hope our audience uh, know us. Jeff and I do the pod every week and BioCentury this week, and it is really a pleasure to be doing this. Bioequity Europe special podcast here in Milano. Excellent. Well, Simone, I know you've been bouncing around from conference room to conference room over the past 24 hours. You did the scene setter panel. You've tended quite a few others. I'm curious if there's any overarching themes from the sessions that have emerged so far on the first full day of the conference. Well, first of all, Jeff, let me just tell you, I think most people at the conference will tell you the overarching theme is the absolute buzz and energy that there is. The sort of special point in time here as we hopefully come out of the pandemic, but certainly are just really happy to see people face to face, a different level of emotion in doing that than uh, biotech executives normally uh, a different kind of embrace than we're normally <laughs> used to. So um, there's been a lot of energy, a lot of interest. We did our scene setter opening panel last night, followed by McKinsey's report, which I know you're going to say a couple of words on. And I, I do have a couple of themes because there was one statistic that we and McKinsey came across separately. And that is there's quite often this perception, we've been focusing on talent and the talent crunch and the capital crunch, there is quite often this perception that you can't hire U.S. Uh, C-suite into European companies, that that is too difficult because they're less well-funded than other companies in the U.S., and it's really an uphill struggle. But actually, our data at BioCentury shows that in 2021, one-third of the C-suite hires into, U into European companies were actually from the U.S., and coming at it from a different direction, McKinsey came up with the same statistic, actually about a third. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And we had some discussion that maybe Francesca will comment on in a minute regarding the ability to hire from the US. Um, actually, I'm going to stop it there and throw that to, to Francesca right away. Francesca, in your experience, how do you look at that? And is it changing? So it's, tr it's true that it has been much easier to recruit generally. I would say until a year ago, or until six months ago, huh? we'll, we'll check, we'll see now how it goes as we go into the, into the downturn. But for the last couple of years, it has been a, an easier exercise to hire any kind of executive, American or European, in any of the, of the private stage by the companies, exactly because, of course, 2020, 2021 have been incredible years. So I, I'm not sure if this trend, which is real, is really just focused or, or confined to the uh, situation of the pandemics, and so that now there will be a readjustment, or if indeed there is a more structural trend. Obviously, the European biotechnology scene is much more mature than it was only five, six, seven years ago. We've had a lot of cash going into the industry for, for many, many years. 
I do believe that is linearly becoming easier generally to hire top people into biotech companies, certainly compared to 20 years ago or to, to 25 years ago, where a career in biotech was a very exotic and uncertain kind of path. So yes, I, I do believe there is something. I still have got to suspend the judgment uh, to really see if how these next six months or these last six months will have impacted uh, this trend. That, that's great, Francesco. And I have um, a, another trend that came up in my panel and then in a couple of other panels this morning. As we talked about what are the qualities that people want in a CEO, what makes a good CEO? One of the themes that's emerging, in particular in this downturn, I mean, historically or re recently in history, the idea is, you know, a CEO has to be able to raise money. A good CEO has money raising ability or, an, or a track record in that. And what seems to be emerging is this idea that right now, we're not necessarily looking for CEOs who can raise money, maybe because there isn't so much to raise. <laughs> but, but what we're really emphasizing is execution, is CEOs who can execute. And, you know, one person uh, raised the idea, actually, that maybe European CEOs, I don't know if you want to generalize, but this person's idea is that European CEOs are more sort of less flashy and into the, the sell, 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 and actually more down to earth and actually practical and pragmatic and, and very good on the execution. I don't know if you want to talk about regional differences, but is that also something that you would say is, is a shifting priority? So I have a strong opinion on, on what is a CEO and what we look for when we hire a CEO. And, and of course, capacity or capability of telling the story, articulating the story, these are important things. Capacity of execution, these are important things. But these are things that uh, I must say are you know, easy to spot and monitor. The difficult part of the hiring of a CEO is really the capacity of identifying a decision maker. What is difficult in, in the CEO job is really being able to take decisions based on incomplete information. Most of the times, our CEOs are running on incomplete information with limited cash against timelines. So decisions is really the most difficult thing to take. And when you have a whiteboard with plus, plus, plus reasons in favor of a decision and minus, minus, minus against a certain decision, the great CEOs are the ones that are able to, to transform that multivariate composed, you know, compositions of reasons in favor, reasons against a certain decision to make it a binary output and take a decision that time will tell turns out to be a right decision. So decision-making capacity or the capability of taking a decision and believing that that was the right decision until really is shown otherwise, that is a talent which, of course, is difficult to spot, is difficult to interview for, it's difficult to find on a CV, and that is the single most important feature. Granted that if there is a great decision maker that then cannot articulate a story to third parties, forget investors. Investors is the easy part. Regulators, KOL, people that really need to be understanding what is the value proposition of a certain product. If you're not able to, to articulate your story in, a, in an objective, compelling way, or if you are incapable of leading a team that at least need to execute, of course, these are no goals. But the single most important and single most difficult feature to spot in a CEO is the capacity of taking decisions in an environment which is uh, incomplete and difficult. So first of all, I completely agree with you. And I think that the inability to make decisions or make decisions in a timely way, especially in this environment, could be incredibly costly for companies. And I, you know, I, I don't know if you both are seeing this in your environment, but I've had one person say to me that actually what they are seeing in the smaller companies is just a real slowdown in decision making all the way along the chain. So are you seeing any kind of slowdown or change in pace at the decisions in the companies and environments that you're working in? I mean, in terms of MSD, we have quite a streamlined decision-making process. I mean, I, I'm not kind of well-versed in, in how J&J &J or others make their decision. I know a little bit about other companies, but actually it's pretty much like a biotech. The person you are in contact with, the, the BD lead, let's say, is the person who will present your project to the decision maker, which is the president of the Merck Research Labs directly, obviously in a governance meeting. So 
at least at MSD is pretty streamlined. But I, I know, I mean, your point was also about our other companies we're talking to slowing down in, in decision making on making deals. I mean, I haven't seen that myself, that there, there's any kind of slowdown in, in decision making. If, if I can I add just one, one comment on this question by Simon. So I, I would say that what I'm noticing, and let's focus the conversation on what has happened in decision making in the last six, nine months, right? Where the, the going has got tough. I, I don't see a slowing really of the decision making. I do see a polarization of decisions on certain aspects of the business, right? So remember that I'm speaking from a very specific vantage point, right? Most of the startups that I'm involved with, Medici is running 52, 53 startups. Most of them are startups, are preclinical, early phase one stage companies with small teams, very focused on a goal. So drug development decisions, uh, they are, of course, the cash is available for them in our business model. The weather forecast or the general environment doesn't have a lot of bearing on our internal decision making. But it's true that the project managers, CEOs of our companies are very focused on other situations rather than, than uh, you know, budgets and costs. And so the other situations are, I don't want to say opportunistically, but you know, is there anything else that is coming available in terms of new assets in the industry? Because many, you know, we, we read on BioCentury every, every week, there is so many startups that are leaving assets behind simply because they have to focus on their main assets. And so there, there is a, for the companies which are financed in a strategic way, so in a way with, with a view on the future, there is almost an attitude of a frenzy of saying, hey, if there is so much available out there that becomes available, we should also try to lock in other assets. And we have a business model where we do not combine assets in the same companies. But so that is increasing. And I don't want to sound cynical, but from our standpoint, it's increasing deal flow because there are these assets which are coming, uh, coming along. But in our little startups, decision-making is not really impacted by the interest rates or by the weather forecast, exactly because our projects, they've got milestone-based financing plans. And as long as the technology delivers or doesn't deliver, that is what triggers the technology. So and that is also, I would say, the beauty in this moment, the beauty of our business model, which is a little bit insulated from the world, if you want. We just need to deliver some technology readouts and make sure that pharma still acquires innovation externally. As long as those two conditions are met, we just need to stay heads down and work and not to, to worry about. But in the larger companies, I have less familiar with, with larger companies, let's say startup biotechs, which have become bigger. I could imagine that there must be some polarization towards financing. You know, we're seeing in the news that that must be real. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point, Francesco, and it really resonates with some of the findings in the McKinsey report that attendees of the conference go home with. One of the uh, team members at McKinsey presented the report today, and she said that the VC environment in Europe is still very healthy. Partnership deal value and volume is continuing to increase. And so if you are an attendee, look for that report. If you are listening to this and haven't signed up yet for Bioequity Europe, you still can, bioequityeurope.com, and you'll have access to all of these sessions that Kateri and Francesco and Simone are talking about for 30 days. Now, one of the highlight sessions of the past 11 bioequities is the CEO workshop. This year, it focused on extending your runway in a bear market. It's moderated every year by Carol Nukterlein of Roche Venture Fund. And Simone, I know you tuned into that, and there were some interesting comments on deal making for smaller biotechs. So actually, Jeff, I'm just going to give you a very small slice of uh, what went on in that panel. A lot of the panel really talked about previous bear markets, what you learn from previous bear market. It gives a lot of advice to CEOs. Um, you know, actually going back, I think they went back to the 2001, one of the very earlier crises. A lot of situations in that time were sort of solved by consolidation, by by companies either merging, maybe getting bought by farmers. And so I want to actually throw this and bring that idea, you know, with M&A into another theme that's come up 
We've discussed it on the pod, Jeff, and via the Biocentury show, specifically articulated by Jamie Rubin, who's now a CFO at EQRX and was formerly, obviously, an analyst at Goldman Sachs for many years. And sort of her, her position was that there's not going to be this turn of M&A from the farmers that people have been talking about. And the reason she thought for that is that basically, you know, it's not farmers' job to save biotech, and they are looking for assets to fill their patent cliff. And the number of companies that have got assets to that fit the bill for them is really quite small. And so when I talked with one of the panelists afterwards, I think the idea was, well, first of all, what came out through the panel, sorry, was that there's going to be a skewing to partnerships rather than necessarily acquisitions. And partnerships are a way for smaller biotechs to actually obviously get some revenue and things to help their programs move forward. But the other idea was that there might be more small to small consolidation, small company to small company, if they can figure out the financing. So, Katri, you know, you're in involved in this. Um, what, what's your take on what m and is going to look like? Well, I really agree with the comment you, you said someone made at the panel that for pharma, it's about what are their strategic needs to fill their gaps in their pipeline. So, you know, it's somewhat driven by what the market looks like. And of course, there's a downturn, so there should be a lot of opportunity. But my perspective is that it has to fit with your strategy. And at the end of the day, it's not just being able to get, let's say, a lower price for an asset. It's because you've got to build that asset up. And then that's where the real investment comes in and develop that asset. And so I think the problem remains the same is that you're looking for high quality assets that, you know, there's a strategic fit with your pipeline and needs. And usually, you know, when there's high quality assets, there are also other pharma looking <laughs> at the same asset. So I think it's pretty much driven by that rather than that there is a, a wealth of kind of lower valuation assets. But I, I mean, obviously, that will impact things and, and pharma are, you know, and we are on the lookout. So I think it hasn't happened yet. I haven't seen it yet, but I think there will be more deal and M&A activity in the coming months, years. But I'm even surprised it hasn't already started. Yeah, another, another finding from the McKinsey report, which probably speaks to that, is that pharmas have a lot of dry powder for deal making. Uh, McKinsey is estimating that they have $322 billion by year end. 2022. So Kateri, hopefully, uh, you know, when you walk out of here, you'll check your ledgers and find that you have a little extra to do some interesting deals, perhaps with uh, one of Francesco's companies. I'd also like to give a plug for another panel that happened today. It's our China Europe Roundtable. It was co-hosted by Bay Helix. And there was a lot of reaction to the US FDA's rebuff of the PD-1 therapy from Innovent and Lilly. Sort of a deal-making idea that came out of that was that what's going to result is a lot of mid-size opportunities to conduct cross-border trials. China biotechs don't necessarily have the same resources or speciality to run uh, multi-regional clinical trials. And so they're likely going to need to partner with Western biotechs. And now that China is no longer so focused on me to me better assets, there could be an opportunity for Western biotechs to tap into the wave of innovation coming out of China, whereas it used to be sort of the other way around. And that's a panel that if you missed today, you can catch up on via the bioequity.com website. I'd like to thank Kateri and Francesco for joining us today. I'm sure they're eager to either go collapse after a long day or, or maybe uh, enjoy a uh, relaxing refreshment with some colleagues they haven't seen in person in a while. Simone, as always, great to do the podcast with you. Thank you very much. All of our podcasts are available on Stitcher, Apple, Google, and our podcast music is brought to you by Kendall Square Orchestra, obviously based in Boston. If you are in the Boston area, check out their 
Symphony for Science. It's coming up next week, May 23rd, and it's a benefit for STEM literacy and education for girls. So check that out. Francesco, a last word? Kateri, a last word before we go? Uh, just to say that, uh, as, as Simone was saying in the, in the introduction, it's really nice, the buzz and the energy that there has been around at this event. It's been great. Actually, a lot of people, really a lot of people, you know, I've been here. I think I've met half of my colleagues uh, from the industry. I've been here only, you know, a day. And uh, so this has been great. I'm really very thankful that you guys have organized this and you run this. Uh, you know, so far, so good has been very exciting. So thank you. I'm looking forward to going mix in the, in the networking cocktails that are going to happen just after. Yeah, I mean, I really echo that comment. It's just so nice to see people face to face and everyone's really, really excited. And I must say that there's a real buzzy feeling around the European biotech. There's just so much innovation, so much going on. It's really nice to see. Excellent. And we'll be coming back tomorrow. Um, Stephen Hansen, BioCentury Associate Editor, will be joining me and we'll have a conversation with Sharon Cunningham, who is the co-founder and CEO of Shorla Oncology, and Bobby Sony, who is the CBO of the Bio Innovation Institute. And we'll also recap some of the day's panels and we'll look ahead to Bioequity Europe Next year, you can start registering now for it. And given that we sold out our in-person passes, you might want to do that now. And it's tough to beat Milan, but Dublin is going to try. BioCentury This Week is brought to you by MSD. MSD has a strong history of success in translating cutting-edge research into life-saving medical breakthroughs. The Pharma's European Innovation Hub which is located in London, is embedded in one of Europe's key scientific communities to drive engagement with local academia, biotech, peer pharma, and venture capitalists. The hub includes a business development and licensing team, clinical teams, and the pharma's UK Discovery Research Center. MSD, also known as Merkin Co. Incorporated, is located in Kenilworth, New Jersey. For more information, visit msd.com slash licensing. Thanks, and we'll catch you tomorrow. <laughs>